Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's video, I want to talk about the Russian economy. So we spent a lot of time recently talking about energy exports and oil and gas and all of the raw materials that Russia has that the rest of the world needs. But in today's video, I want to talk about more than just energy because an economy isn't just based on raw materials. It's based on a whole variety of different goods and services. And some of those goods and services are produced by other countries. So it doesn't matter how big a nation is, there will be certain things that other countries make that you need to import. So in today's video, I want to look at the sanctions that have been imposed against Russia. We'll have a look at the global supply chain and some of the technology issues that I think are really important in terms of the future success of the Russian economy. And then we'll go through the details in terms of what's happening right now in Russia with regards to inflation, what the forecasts are in terms of GDP for 2022 and 2023. We'll have a look at what's going on with the ruble because I think there's a lot of discussion right now about the strengthening of the ruble. So I want to dig down into that a little bit more. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen to the Russian economy over the course of the next 18 months and what impact that will have on the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content and also to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I always include chapters in my videos. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you can find links to buy me a coffee, Patreon and YouTube's super thanks feature. And I'm delighted to tell you that today's video is brought to you in conjunction with Masterworks. As I'm sure you'll know by now, Following the invasion of Ukraine, Russia was hit with a variety of financial sanctions. Now, some of those sanctions were targeted against Russian companies, Russian individuals, but all of them were designed to hurt the Russian economy, to make it more difficult for Russia to do business, to earn revenue, and to prevent it from bringing in cash to keep funding the war. That was the basic premise behind all of the sanctions. And alongside the official sanctions, a lot of countries and companies took the unilateral decision that they no longer wanted to do any business with Russia. So we've seen announcements from a whole wave of international businesses stating that they are either exiting from their Russian operations or that they'll no longer be doing any future business with their Russian counterparts. And the Yale School of Management in the US have been keeping an official record from the response of all the major companies across the globe. And these records show that currently 313 companies have announced a complete withdrawal from Russia. A further 391 companies have announced that they are suspending all of their operations until further notice. And 118 companies have announced that they're scaling back their operations. So that's a total of 822 companies who have decided that they either are stopping all business or they're suspending operations until further notice. And that's going to have a really big impact on the Russian economy because Russia is still a relatively low cost labor environment. So these companies employ a lot of people across the whole of Russia. Now, at this stage, it's hard to evaluate the exact number of job losses that the Russian economy are going to suffer. But the mayor of Moscow recently announced that he believes that 200,000 jobs are at risk in Moscow alone as a direct result of Western companies suspending their operations. Now, Moscow has a population of around 12 million people out of the total population of 144 million in Russia. So if we were looking at a proportionate representation, then we would be talking over 2 million job losses. Now, it's probably not quite as bad as that because a lot of companies are attracted to Moscow. However, a lot of manufacturing businesses and other enterprises do have locations all across Russia. So as I said, it's hard to put an exact figure on it, but it's likely that the impact in terms of job losses is going to be somewhere between a million and two million job losses if all of these Western companies do decide that they no longer want to do any future business whatsoever in Russia. 
But the effect of the sanctions is not just limited to the companies who've decided to withdraw. Because Russia is now no longer doing business with a lot of the Western world, a lot of the companies within Russia who are exporting products are no longer selling any of those products. So they're now under financial difficulty. And it's very likely that there will be other job losses all across Russia because they've lost their markets. If you've been selling products into Germany and France and the UK and the US and all of the other countries that are now sanctioning Russia, then that means that you've lost all of that trade and therefore you won't be able to afford to pay your workers and so they'll be made unemployed. So the combined impact of that loss of trade and all of the Western companies pulling out is very likely to be in the millions of job losses. We're talking wide scale unemployment across a lot of different sectors and companies in Russia in the short term. Now, I know a lot of people who watch this channel have been saying that it doesn't matter because Russia will just change their focus and start dealing a lot more with Asia and other countries who aren't bothered about the sanctions, but that will take time to achieve. And also there are differences in terms of tastes and preferences and demand. So in a best case scenario, there will be a time lag in terms of finding those new markets. But in a worst case scenario, you could lose that future business because it's not quite as easy to sell into Asia because they're more price competitive. And if your products are not priced at the right level, then you may not achieve any of the sales. Selling items at a higher price point into a developed economy such as the US and Europe is easier than it is selling into a low cost economy such as Asia. So it really isn't logical to assume that Russia can just change focus pivot and start selling everything into Asia and there will be no impact on the economy. In the short term, in 2022, there is going to be a devastating impact in terms of loss of trade, loss of business, loss of profit and loss of jobs in Russia. Although Russia is a developed economy and has an abundance of raw materials, it still imports a lot of goods from around the world. In 2021, Russia imported $293 billion worth of goods. And this table shows the top 10 categories that were imported. Machinery, including computers, equated to $54 billion. Electrical machinery and equipment, $37 billion. $27 billion worth of vehicles. $14 billion worth of pharmaceuticals. $13 billion worth of plastics, $9 billion worth of optical, technical and medical apparatus, $12 billion worth of iron and steel products, $6 billion worth of organic chemicals, and $5 billion worth of fruit and nuts. In terms of the countries that are importing the most goods to Russia, China is at the very top of the list, followed by Germany, the USA, Belarus, Italy, France, South Korea, Japan and Turkey. In terms of the physical transportation of goods, the world still relies upon shipping and containers. That's the most cost effective way to move large volumes of products. And the global shipping and container industry is dominated by a small number of large players. And unfortunately for Russia, the vast majority of those players have all joined into the sanctions and are no longer delivering any items to Russia. So that obviously represents a massive logistical problem for Russia. They need to keep importing certain items. When you've got a population of 144 million out of a global population of almost 8 billion, you just don't have enough scale and demand and technology to be able to be self-sufficient. The globe is a totally integrated system. It's a symbiotic relationship. Some countries are just naturally very good at doing certain things. So Russia needs to keep buying in a variety of equipment and machinery and technology to keep its economy moving. And if we jump back to this list which shows which countries are the biggest importers to Russia, you can see that Germany, the USA, Italy, France, Japan have all signed into the sanctions. So none of those countries or companies involved will be wanting to export any products to Russia any longer. 
But in addition to that supply problem, the global supply chain is also broken from a Russian perspective because they can't access the ships and the containers to be able to load the products and deliver them to Russia. So even if you were looking at replacing some of the supplies that were coming from the European and North American nations, it's very difficult to logistically actually get the products to Russia if you don't have the ships or the containers available. And we've been having a shipping and container problem for the last two years anyway in the world because of COVID. When COVID brought everything to a grinding halt, a lot of the containers were in the wrong places. And then when industry started up again, when China started producing a lot of goods, they couldn't actually load them onto ships because the empty containers were all sitting halfway around the world. And so they didn't have enough of the infrastructure to be able to start moving all the goods. And that's going to be a major problem for Russia. Firstly, they've lost some of their suppliers. But even if they could find replacement suppliers overnight, it's very difficult to get those goods to Russia because of the logistical problems. So this is going to be a double whammy impact for Russia. And the bottom line is going to be that they're going to have shortages of things that they wanted to buy. And those shortages will drive up prices in Russia and will also lead to hardship because people just simply won't be able to get the things that they wanted to buy. So before we move on any further, I want to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Masterworks. Finding new and innovative ways to invest your capital to avoid the deterioration of inflation is a challenge for all of us. Masterworks was founded in 2017 to give investors the opportunity to invest directly into the art market. Masterworks focuses on contemporary art and between 1995 and 2021, that market outpaced the S&P 500 by 164%. The way that the Masterworks business model operates is that they buy a contemporary piece of art and then they securitize it, which means that you can buy shares in a piece of art by Andy Warhol or Banksy or Picasso. And when Masterworks sell that piece of art in the future, then you will be given your percentage share of those sale proceeds. Now, obviously, there's no guarantee of future price rises or profits, so you need to do your own research. But if you're interested in joining the 400,000 people who've already invested with Masterworks, then have a look in the description below where you'll find a link to be able to skip the queue to invest with masterworks.io. Technology potentially represents a major problem for Russia going forward. As you'll know if you follow the channel, there has been a microchip shortage over the last couple of years. The pandemic resulted in the suspension of microchip production, and that loss of production had a massive knock-on impact to a variety of different sectors. In today's world, a lot of machinery relies upon microchips. So if you think about your home, there are so many different products now that rely upon microchips at the heart of their technology. So your washing machine, your TV, your dryer, but even simple products are now becoming smart technology. And so they're incorporating microchips. And that's the way everybody wants the world to work. We want to be able to look on our phone and see what's in the fridge to be able to decide what to buy for dinner. That's the way everything is moving. And unfortunately for Russia, they don't have enough advanced technology to be able to produce the level of microchips that are needed to keep their economy at the sharp end of developments. Now, this has been an ongoing problem for Russia for a long period of time. After the annexation of Crimea in 2014, the Kremlin ordered all government bodies to stop using foreign software. However, by the end of 2019, only 10% of software used by state agencies was made in Russia. Which shows that this isn't because Russia are not trying to deliver that tech. It's because they don't have the technology. They're not able to produce the very high spec chips that are needed. This table shows the value of chip imports to Russia over the last five years. And the 2021 chart is only for the first six months of the year. So if we assume that chip imports continue at the same rate, the full year figure for 2021 would be over $60 million. And if we look at the breakdown of where those chips are imported from, you can see that Germany is the largest importer, followed by China, Japan, USA, Hong Kong, and Finland. 
So at a very basic level, if you remove Germany, USA and Finland from this table, then that is going to be a big percentage of Russia's chips lost. Japan may also need to be removed from this list in terms of sanctioning, and that will leave Russia in a very precarious position. The hangover from the pandemic is that there is still an ongoing shortage of chips globally. So it is not possible for Russia to be able to just dip into the market and replace any lost supplies with supplies from China because there just isn't the availability. But in addition to the sheer availability, there is also the technological issue because some of the chips that are produced under license are highly developed and therefore are not easy to replace. You can't just find an alternative chip directly from China. And this point was highlighted recently by Russian Central Bank Governor Elvira Nabulina, who stated that the period when the economy can live on reserves is finite and already in the second and third quarter, we will enter a period of structural transformation and the search for new business models. The main problems will be associated with restrictions on imports and logistics of foreign trade. Russian manufacturers will need to search for new partners, logistics or switch to the production of products of previous generations. So essentially what she's saying there is if the requisite technology is not available within Russia or from its trading partners, then Russia will have to downgrade all of its products to meet the old style of technology. Inflation in Russia is now running at its highest rate since 2002. The annual inflation rate for the past 12 months is now at 17.6%. This rate compares to 2.7% that Russia was experiencing this time last year. This chart shows that the weekly rate of increase has actually been declining. However, the producer price index in March was around 27%. And as you'll know if you follow the channel, the producer price index really is an indication of future consumer price index levels because those prices will need to be passed on to consumers as and when all of the goods are finished and brought to market. The head of Russia's audit chamber, Alexei Kudrin, has estimated that inflation could reach up to 20% this year. However, a recent Reuters poll forecast that the rate would be closer to 24%. One of the reasons that there's been a slowdown in the weekly inflation rates is that the central bank increased interest rates in Russia from 9.5% to 20% on the 28th of February. The official interest rate was subsequently lowered to 17% on the 8th of April and the central bank governor has announced that the intention is to continue reducing those rates as and when inflation starts to level off. The combined impact of the loss of jobs, rising inflation and the loss of trade across the world is going to result in a major recession in Russia in 2022 and potentially also in 2023. An official document released by the Russian Economy Ministry shows that they expect the economy to contract by somewhere between 8.8% and 12.4% in 2022. The document goes on to forecast growth of 1.3% in 2023, 4.6% in 2024 and 2.8% in 2025. They're also expecting inflation to increase to 22.6% this year. This chart shows the movement in the valuation of the Russian ruble against the US dollar over the last six months. Prior to the commencement of the war, the ruble was trading at around about 75 to 80 rubles to $1. As soon as the invasion started, the valuation fell dramatically and at one point was touching around 150 rubles to $1. However, since that low point, we have seen a remarkable recovery in the valuation of the ruble and it is now trading at a stronger level than it has done for a very long time. Now, at first glance, this recovery seems counterintuitive because the way demand and supply works for currency is that when there is strong demand for a currency, it generally means that it will appreciate in value. And if there is weaker demand, then generally it will depreciate in value. And that's what we saw at the start of this conflict, because when the sanctions were imposed and a lot of companies started stating that they no longer wanted to do any business in Russia, that meant that the demand for Russian rubles was likely to fall. 
And so the valuation of the ruble fell significantly. Now, those dynamics haven't really changed. And in fact, they probably got worse since the start of this conflict because a lot more countries and companies have come out to support the sanctions. And so the demand for rubles is very, very low right now. However, what we have seen is a number of initiatives within Russia to increase the internal demand for rubles. Firstly, a decree was issued to all exporters, instructing them to hand over 80% of all of their foreign currency assets and to exchange that foreign currency for rubles. So technically, that meant that all of those companies were buying rubles and selling euros or dollars or whatever currency they had. So effectively, that was creating a market for the rubles. In addition to that, we've also seen President Putin come out and advise all of the buyers of, from unfriendly nations that they will now have to pay for all natural gas in rubles. And the way that that will work is that all of those countries have to hand over dollars or euros to Gazprom Bank, and Gazprom Bank will then convert that currency into rubles before it makes a payment to Gazprom, the gas supplier. And as Europe is buying around $450 million worth of gas every single day, that's creating quite a lot of demand for rubles. On the flip side of the market, there are absolutely no sellers of rubles because all of the countries around the world who are sanctioning Russia don't have any rubles. Nobody's looking to sell. So we've got a buyer's only market. It's a very thin market. It's only really being handled within Russia, but it's a buyer's only market and that's driven up the price. So that really explains why we've seen such a massive strengthening in the valuation of the ruble and why it's now trading at a higher level than it's been trading for quite some time. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video really to give you an update as to what's going on within Russia, but also to really give you a full understanding as to what the impact of these sanctions will be on the Russian economy. When the sanctions were brought in following the invasion of Crimea in 2014, it was estimated that it took over 12 months for those sanctions to really feed through into the figures for the economy. Because Russia is sitting on a lot of reserves and supplies, it will be able to run down the stock of all the items that it's got in storage right now. So there won't be an immediate drastic impact. Russia will be holding supplies of microchips that it can continue feeding into its factories and continue making things. But there will come a point when they'll need to be able to find new suppliers, whether it be of microchips or machinery or pharmaceuticals or other items. And the problem that Russia is going to encounter is that the global supply chain really hasn't recovered from what happened during the pandemic and they have got very limited options in terms of their new trading partners. So they may be able to find new business partners in Asia, but the question is, can they get the logistics in place to be able to satisfy that trade? And also, is the market in Asia a direct replacement for the markets that they've been selling their goods and services into over the last 10 years or so? The other major logistical problem for Russia is the imports. Will they be able to find a like-for-like -like replacement for all the goods and products that they've been buying from the Western world? So a great example is iPhones, Apple iPhones. So Apple have suspended all of their operations in Russia and you won't be able to buy a new iPhone in Russia right now. And going forward, if we see a continuation of these sanctions, it means that Russians will no longer be able to buy iPhones. Now, if you're not an iPhone fan, then maybe you're thinking that's a good thing. But the reason for mentioning it is it's just going to reduce the amount of choice that Russians have for everything that they want to buy. In today's world, we live in a fully integrated society. You can buy products from all over the globe. And if you're no longer able to access those products, then it doesn't automatically follow that the replacement product is just as good. It isn't the way the world works. But in addition to the actual supply of goods and products from around the world, we've also got major problems going on right now with regards to inflation, which is at its highest level for 20 years, employment, which is falling dramatically. There have been hundreds of companies who've pulled out of Russia overnight, and there's thousands of companies who are no longer trading with Russia. So we've got the direct loss of jobs from those Western companies, but we've also got the loss of jobs that will feed through into the economy from the loss of trade. 
And the outlook for Russia for this year and next year is fairly grim. We are looking at a deep recession kicking into the economy. And that's going to mean hardship for a lot of the Russian citizens. And it's going to mean more cost for the Russian central government because they're going to have to fund various schemes to be able to keep paying people. So I guess the summary here is that although Russia is very rich in terms of raw materials and will continue to make money from the sale of oil and natural gas, even if they have to find new markets, the economy of Russia is going to suffer badly in 2022 and the people of Russia are going to suffer even worse because we're going to see large price increases, a fall in income and a reduction in the standard of living for the vast majority of Russians. And as I said a few moments ago, the impact of the sanctions will take time to feed through. But by the end of 2022, Russia will be in a deep recession and it's going to be interesting to see how quickly they can come back out of that. So hopefully you found today's video useful, informative and educational. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hey guys, just a very quick note on Joe Blogs 2. Things are continuing to go well. We're building up that watch time. We're building up the subscriber base, but I still haven't got to that 4,000 hours level yet. So if you've got time and the inclination, please jump over to the channel, watch one or two of the videos or press on the playlist and we'll get to that 4,000 hours and then we can start posting some more interesting, exciting videos. Thanks for watching this and thanks for watching this video all the way to the end.